broadcast. The title of our program is Behind the Door, Part 1. A subtitle for this broadcast could also be The Sinking of the Titanic. When we think of events that have transpired in history over the last 100 to 200 years, there are certain events that stand out in our mind as ones of great horror, great surprise, and great sadness. Three events that come to my mind right off the top of my head would be the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and then the sinking of the Titanic. Before we get into the information that we're going to look at in this program together, I would invite you to bow your heads with me. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for the truth of thy word. Thank you for the beauty and the power therein to help us to turn away from that which is wrong and to do that which is right in your sight. Father, as we seek to go behind the door and analyze some events from history, we pray for the guidance of thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. And verse 1 through 3. The Bible declares, There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication." So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. Now we find in this passage in Revelation 17 we find several symbols. Number one, we have a great whore that is com coming under judgment from heaven. And if we look very carefully at other passages of Scripture, if we look in the second and third chapters of Jeremiah, the first chapter of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, Jeremiah, chapter 3, verses 6 through 8, if we look in Ezekiel, chapter 16, in fact, almost the whole chapter, and then if we look in the book of Hosea, in Hosea chapters 1 through 3, we find a consistent theme running through the Bible. And that is this. When a church or a group of people who are following and walking with heaven, if they turn away from God and go into complete apostasy so that there is Nothing God can do to save that group or organization. God refers to them as a harlot or as a whore. So an apostate or a filthy woman in Scripture, and that's what we think of when we look at a whore or a prostitute, that symbol represents a church that has gone into total apostasy from heaven. That's how God referred to the children of Israel in those Old Testament passages, continuously, repeatedly referred to as a whore or a prostitute. So we have here in Revelation 17 judgments that are going to fall on an apostate church. And we know in verse 5 that her name is Babylon the Great and she's the mother 
of other little churches, other churches that have followed in her footsteps. Because it says that Babylon the Great is the mother of harlots. So, Revelation 17, verse 1, is dealing with an apostate religious organization that has gone totally away from heaven. And there's nothing God can do to save that organization. Now, verse 2 of Revelation 17 declares that the kings of the earth have committed fornication with this apostate church. So the governments of the world through the centuries has been in union with this apostate religious power. And it says that the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. We know in the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, verses 7 through 12, we find that God's professed people, his leaders especially, the priests and prophets, they were drunk and they were delivering false messages. And in the midst of that, in Isaiah 28, God said, Who shall we teach knowledge? Who shall we give understanding to? Who shall we teach with new doctrine, with clear, pure doctrine of Scripture? So it's very clear in the context of Isaiah 28, verses 7 through 12 and on, that wine in the Bible, in a spiritual or symbolic sense, represents false teachings. And it says that the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with these false teachings. And these false teachings are embraced by this apostate church because they want to be in corrupt harmony with the governments of this world. Now, I think it's pretty clear as you look at history that there has been one religious power that has sought to be unified and even to control governments throughout the ages. It can only be the Roman Catholic Church. And it's stated in verse 2 that not only did the Catholic Church unite with the governments of the world and control them for centuries, it also says that they would use false teachings to make the inhabitants of the world drunk. And there are so many false teachings emanating from Rome today, we couldn't even name all of them. But we'll just mention a few. Number one is the idol, idolatry in the worship of the Virgin Mary, who is sleeping in the dust of the earth today. The concept of that when you die, you go to heaven, that the soul is immortal, has its roots in Greek thought, and then it was picked up and promoted by the Roman Catholic Church. The worship of relics, the necessity of pilgrimages to earn salvation by works, uh, the, the Lord's Supper, and the blasphemous thought that a priest can actually turn bread into the actual body of Christ, that the creature can recreate the Creator. And then, of course, we have Rome's attack on the Ten Commandments, knocking out the Second Commandment that forbids image worship, and then telling the world to worship on Sunday. These are just a few of the many blasphemous teachings of Rome. Now, Revelation 17 and verse 3 declares, So he carried me away in the Spirit into the wilderness, and I saw this woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast. This, of course, is the same woman that we already saw in Revelation 17, 1 and 2. This is the papacy. This is the apostate church. But I want you to notice something. Here it says that John had to go into the wilderness to see this power. 
Now, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and verse 14, we read that the woman, now this is talking about a pure woman here in Revelation 12, verse 6. It says that she fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, Revelation 12 and verse 14 is talking about the same event. And it's saying that God's true church had to flee into the wilderness through much of the 1260 year period. Now, what does the wilderness represent that God's true church had to flee into for 1260 years? If you go in your book called The Great Controversy, we read these words. It says, For hundreds of years the church of Christ found refuge in seclusion and obscurity. Thus says the prophet, and then Ellen White quotes Revelation 12 and verse 6. So the true church fled into the wilderness or into hiding into seclusion and obscurity for 1260 years, or at least for the better part of that time period. So the wilderness represents seclusion or obscurity, or being, as it were, behind the door. Now the question I would like to ask you is this. At what period in church history did the Roman Catholic Church go behind the door? When did they change their garments from being blood red to being Christ-like? When did Rome begin to change the impression and the face that she would give to the world? It's very clear that this passage in Revelation 17 is sister to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3, where the Bible says, And I saw one of her heads as if it were wounded to death, and her deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. We know that the Catholic Church received a deadly wound at the end of the 1260-year period in 1798. And it was in 1798 that the papacy went into seclusion. They went into obscurity. And many, many of the papacy's acts would be done in secret so that people would not know who the true power was behind an act that they were actually doing because they wanted to give the world a face as though they had changed. Now with that in mind, that since 1798 the Catholic Church has been in the wilderness or behind the door, understanding that, I want us to analyze some events And this will be a several-part series entitled Behind the Door. And this is just part one. But we're going to be analyzing several events in history that have taken place since around the time period of 1798 and analyze who really was behind some of these atrocities that have taken place. Now, I think it's pretty clear at this point that I'm taking the position that if rightly understood and the evidence is allowed to speak for itself, it is clear that in major events, major tragedies and atrocities that have occurred in the last 200 plus years fall right into the hands of the Roman Catholic Church. And in particular an order of the Catholic Church that was established back in the early 1540s. You see, friends, 
the Protestant Reformation was very, very successful. In just a short 20 to 25 year period, dating to the nailing of the 95 Theses on the door at Wittenberg in 1517, if you come down 25 years, you find tremendous strides have been taken. So much so that the Roman Catholic Church convened a council. It is known by two names. One, Vatican Council Number 1, or the Council of Trent. And it took place in the early to mid-1540s. The purpose for this council was to gather together and to see how the Protestant Reformation could be destroyed. We read in Great Controversy, page 234, where Ellen White declares this, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the Order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason, and conscience, wholly silenced. They knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. On page 235, we read, and I'm skipping a little bit, it says, under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order of the Jesuits that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination, were not only pardonable, but commendable when they serve the interests of the church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters and so on. I believe that the evidence is clear that some of the greatest tragedies in the last 200 years can be traced right back to the order of the Jesuits. You say, Bill, are you telling me that the sinking of the Titanic was a ploy of the Jesuit order? Are you telling me that there is evidence to support the fact that it was the Jesuits who sunk the unsinkable Titanic? Why would they do that? How could do that? These will be some of the questions that we will be answering as this tape continues on behind the door. Let us look at history to understand the events leading up to the sinking of the Titanic. The year was 1909. The building of the Titanic had just begun at a shipyard in Belfast, the capital of Northern Ireland. Belfast, of course, is a Protestant haven and was hated by the Jesuit order. World War One is just a few years away. World War Two is already being planned. 
There would be two wars to so devastate Europe that all the world would want to have a united nation. There was something else going on in the United States at this time in the early 1900s. In my hands I have a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island. It was written by C. Edward Griffin. In this book, Mr. Griffin makes it very, very clear that there were many peoples in the world that wanted to create a Federal Reserve Bank here in the United States so that they could finance finance the League of Nations that they were already planning to have after World War I, and if it didn't go through then, they would create another war and have a United Nations after World War II. But in order for these wars to be fought, the powers that be in this world, the Jesuit order, the money peoples, the Illuminati, which is simply an arm of the Jesuit order, they would need a place where they could get money by the millions and millions of dollars. And so a Federal Reserve Bank was being talked about and was being created right here in the United States of America. But there would be those who would oppose this Federal Reserve Bank and they would oppose the using of this bank to finance these wars that were taking place. There were those who had great power and great wealth who would not participate in the setting up of this bank. They would not lend their means and their influence in its support. So what would have to happen then? Their power and fortune would have to be taken out of their hands. They had to be ushered out of this world in a most terrifying way. They would have to be destroyed. And so what happened? The White Star Line, which was a fleet of ships that carried passengers across the Atlantic Ocean, they also brought many immigrants from Europe into the United States. The White Star Line had the ship called the Titanic built. And on that ship called the Titanic, there would be many Irish, French, and Italian Roman Catholics. They would be people that could simply be eliminated. And also on this ship would be invited Protestants from Belfast who wanted to immigrate to the United States. But also there would be invited on board this floating palace some of the wealthiest people in all the world. Now, the ones I'm specifically referring to would be Benjamin Guggenheim, Isidore Strauss, the head of Macy's department stores, and probably the most wealthy man in all the world, a man by the name of John Jacob Astor. These three men were coaxed and encouraged to board the floating palace. And these were three of the men earmarked for destruction. These three had to be destroyed because these men would use their wealth to oppose a Federal Reserve Bank and they would oppose the various wars that were being planned. Now you say, Bill, 
why would the Jesuit order go to such lengths? Why would they sink a huge ship with over 2,000 people on board? Why would they go to all that trouble just to get rid of these three wealthy men who would oppose their plans? Why not just poison them? Why not just happen to run them over or shoot them as the Jesuit order has done to other people? It's for this reason. Number one, the setting up of the United Nations or the League of Nations was absolutely crucial to the takeover of this world by the Jesuit order. And the setting up of a financial institution in the United States that could fund these operations was absolutely critical or they wouldn't be able to have the wars in the first place. If these men would oppose the wars or if these men would oppose the setting up of the Federal Reserve Bank, then it's very possible that others would follow suit and they might go along with these three wealthy men. So they had to be destroyed. You say, but why go to such lengths? If they didn't do it this way, then others may follow along. Others may resist the Jesuit order and their plans as well. And so the Jesuit order created this floating palace, the Titanic, so that it would be, number one, it would take care of and get rid of these three wealthy men. But number two, it would be a warning to any other person with great wealth who might oppose the plans that the Jesuits had for this earth. So they went to great lengths so that if anybody would dare resist them, they could simply go to them and say, do you remember what happened to those three other wealthy men that were on board the Titanic? Did you see what we did to them? We'll do the same thing to you if you do not cooperate. I believe we have a very, very recent parallel in American history. The Jesuit order realized that if the, if the evidence came out about what truly happened in Waco, Texas, all of that information was on file in the Alfred P. Murray building in Oklahoma City. All they could have done was had a fire in that one office and burned it up. Or they could have done, you know, they could have gone in and had the file stolen. But instead the Jesuit order went to great lengths and had the entire building bombed and many innocent lives lost to send a message to people, don't get involved in what's going on. And if you do, what happened in the Murray building can happen to you too. So you see, the Titanic was not the first, was not the only time that the Jesuits have gone to great lengths to wipe out people. At this point in our study, let's turn it over to side two called Behind the Door, The Sinking of the Titanic. We'd like to welcome you to side two of our broadcast on the sinking of the Titanic. I'd like to share with you as we begin this side of the tape probably the most compelling evidence that it was indeed the Jesuit order that had the Titanic destroyed. And it, it revolves around the captain of the ship. 
The man's name was Edward Smith. He was the world's greatest pilot and master of the North Atlantic waters. He had been traveling the North Atlantic waters for 26 years. Now, Edward Smith was what you would call a Jesuit temporal coadjutor. This simply means that he was not a priest, but he was a Jesuit of the short robe, as the French would say. He was serving the Jesuit order in his profession. So there's some people that serve the Jesuits, and they are indeed priests. But there are other Jesuits that serve it through their profession, whether it be as a baker, as a politician, as a police officer, as an agent for the government, whatever it might be. But Edward Smith served the Jesuit order in his profession. So Edward Smith, then, was the captain of the Titanic. That's very interesting. In a tape, it's a videotape that was done by National Geographic in 1986, entitled The Secrets of the Titanic. On that videotape, we find these interesting points. Number one, when the Titanic departed from southern England on April 10, 1912, the master of Edward Smith boarded the Titanic. This man who boarded the Titanic at that point was the most powerful Jesuit in all of Ireland and answered directly to the general of the Jesuit order whose name was Francis Warrants. The captain's master, Edward Smith's master, was the provincial superior of the Irish province of the Society of Jesus, a man by the name of Francis Brown. Now on this tape, The Secrets of the Titanic, put out by National Geographic, it shows and it states, and I'll quote it for you right here, it states that a vacationing priest, Father Francis Brown, once again, the most powerful Jesuit in all of Ireland boarded the Titanic. And the tape declares he caught these poignant snapshots of his fellow passengers, most of them on a voyage to eternity. The next day, Titanic made her last stop, pausing off the coast of Queenstown, Ireland. Here, tenders brought out the last passengers mostly Irish immigrants headed for new homes in America. And here, the lucky Father Brown disembarked. And then the tape says, Father Brown caught Captain Smith peering down from Titanic's bridge, poised on the brink of destiny. Now, I saw that videotape just recently, and it was very fascinating because as Francis Brown is leaving, he takes one last shot. And up there, about three stories up on the Titanic, Edward Smith, the captain, is looking out a window. And he's looking down and he sees as Father Brown disembarks. I found it very interesting that the videotape on the secrets of the Titanic stated that Father Brown was lucky because he didn't die in the sinking of the Titanic. A question we would have to ask ourselves is, is number one, why was Francis Brown the most powerful Jesuit in all of Ireland? Why did he get on board the Titanic? And then, just a day or two before it crashed, why did Father Brown get off? I believe 
that Father Brown got on board that ship and he went over with Edward Smith one last time exactly what he was supposed to do in the North Atlantic waters. I believe he went step by step through it and told him exactly what was going to happen and how it was he that was to bring the ship down. Now there's another interesting point that comes into play because at this very time when the Titanic was being built we find that in England there had been a strike in the shipyard and there were many many people that should have been helping on the Titanic who were striking in England and that meant that Edward Smith then had to hire other men to help him in managing the Titanic. I believe that there were many people, many soldiers of Edward Smith that were hired by the Jesuit order to work along with Edward Smith to bring it down and that the strike in England over the shipyard people was contrived at the last minute. So Francis Brown, the most powerful Jesuit in all of Ireland, boards the ship and gives Edward Smith his final orders and the men that, was, that were working with him. You say, but wait a minute, you're telling me that Edward Smith then he meant to sink the ship? That is exactly what I'm saying. As we read a few moments ago in Great Controversy, the, to the Jesuits, the end justifies the means. They will assassinate, they will murder, they will poison whomever they will to further their designs. And if one of their men dies in the process, that's okay. We must remember an Italian Jesuit wrote in 1624 by the command of God it is lawful to murder the innocent to rob, to commit all lewdness because the Pope is Lord of life and death and of all things and thus to fulfill his mandate is our duty. a man who used to be or who wrote a book called The History of the Jesuits. His name is G.B. Nicolini. In 1854, he said this, There is no record in history of an association whose organization has stood for 300 years unchanged and unaltered by the assaults of men and time and which has exercised such an immense influence over the destinies of man. The ends justify the means is his favorite maxim, and as his only end, as we have shown, is the order at its bidding the Jesuit is ready to commit any crime whatsoever. Let us not forget the oath that every person takes to become a part of the Jesuit order. I should regard myself as a dead body without will or intelligence, as a little crucifix which is turned about unresistingly at the will of him who holds it, as a staff in the hands of an old man who uses it as he requires it and as it suits him best. What this is simply stating is, is that when a man takes a Jesuit oath, that man is bound to his leaders till the day he dies. And those people, if necessary, they will even become martyrs in order to carry out their orders. Edward Smith had become a man without will or intelligence. 
he would commit any crime. Edward Smith had been required for martyrdom. On board the Titanic that night, Edward Smith knew his duty. He was under oath. The ship had been built for the enemies of the Jesuit order. And then after three days at sea with only one pair of glasses for the bridge, Edward Smith propelled the Titanic full steam ahead, 22 knots, on a moonless dark night through a gigantic ice field nearly 80 square miles in size. Edward Smith did this despite at least eight telegrams warning him to be more cautious because he was going too fast. Did Edward Smith need one caution? No. He had been traveling those waters for 26 years. He knew the North Atlantic like the back of his hand. He knew there were icebergs in that area. But eight cautions did not stop this man who was under the Jesuit oath. Edward Smith would not listen to the telegrams of warning. He would not listen to the cautions. He was hell-bent on destruction. He was hell-bent upon approaching the iceberg. When it happened, as they approached the iceberg that split the Titanic, another conspirator... Smith's first officer, a man by the name of Murdoch, orders the engines to be thrown in reverse. Smith told Murdoch to order the engines thrown in reverse while swinging the ship sharply to its left side. This error was a violation of one of the cardinal rules of safety, which is to never turn a ship's broadside to danger. Are we to believe that Captain Smith, a master of his profession, would make such a blunder in addition to steaming full speed ahead through the icebergs that he had been warned about? Edward Smith had been told to break the Titanic in two. And there was nothing that would stop him. As the passengers came to realize that the ship was filling with water, it was going to sink. The Jewish multimillionaires, John Jacob Astor, Benjamin Guggenheim, and Isidore Strauss, were all forbidden to board a lifeboat. John Jacob Astor's second wife, who the National Geographic show a picture of the Astors, John Jacob Astor's second wife survives, gets into a lifeboat and is saved while John Jacob Astor perishes in the waters of the North Atlantic. We find in the tape on the secrets of the Titanic that many of the lifeboats, number one, there was an inadequate number of lifeboats, Number two, as they were letting them down, many of them were less than half full with only women and children. The poorer passengers within the lower levels were to be locked down so as to prevent the Jesuit order's wealthy victims from escaping its watchful eye. 
and possibly boarding a lifeboat amidst the hysteria on deck. And to prevent nearby freighters from responding with help, the distress flares were seen to be white when they should have been red. White flares to passing freighters would state that everybody was having a party when in actuality the ship was beginning to sink. Those selected to board the lifeboats would live. Those who must die the death had no chance, no chance of being set free. One of the greatest tragedies in the 20th century, the sinking of the Titanic, lays at the door of the Jesuit order. God help each one of us to be as willing to submit to Christ as our Lord and Master, as Edward Smith was willing to submit to his Lord and his Master. May we be willing to attempt all to do anything that the Lord Jesus may ask of us. May we be willing to lay our lives on the line for the cause of truth and right with the same devotion and dedication that Edward Smith was willing to do for the sake of murder and wrong. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank you that we've been able to go behind the door. Thank you that we have seen some awful things in this tape. We pray that you would quicken our steps, that we would be willing to do and to dare for your great name. in preaching the gospel to all the world. Father, I pray that you would help us, help us to do thy will continually. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The next time we have a tape entitled Behind the Door, we're going to look at another tragedy of the 20th century. It happened when I was just six years old. On a Dallas street, November 22, 1963. In our next Behind the Door, we'll look at why did JFK die. Until we meet again, may God bless you.